नमस्ते एक्चुअली वेन दी सब्जेक्ट वॉज गिवेन एंड वी जस्ट एक्सेप्टेड दैट यू नो लेट्स स्पीक अबाउट फ्रॉम सियर अगस्त टू श्योर बिंदो समथिंग न्यू फ्लैश बिफोर मी अ मच डीपर कनेक्शन देन वॉट वी हैव ऑफ एन स्पोकन अबाउट इट earlier also i had occasion to speak about sir agast it has been said that sir bindu in one of his previous lives was rishi agast and uh, as many of us are aware just to recapitulate some of these things which many of us may be aware already that this samadhi where right now we have sir bindu and the mothers divine bodies enshrined and by the side of the rectangular samadhi we have a square area where flowers are arranged it has been said in one of the conversations that mother has it seems said this to nalini da amrita that that was the place where rishi agast used to do his it was his yagyavedi and this place uh, pondicherry was known in those days as vedpuri so there are many similarities between the two even outwardly just as we see many similarities between shri bindu's life and shri krishna's life so one of the similarities is that sage agast had come all the way down crossing the vindhyachal and we know one of the reasons one of the ways his name is understood apart from the bright and illumined one is that agat that he who moves that which cannot move so it seems when he was crossing the vindhyachal uh vindhyachal was growing and growing and growing as the result of a boon and as rishi agast was crossing over uh, because people were very troubled even he was you know going and uh, obstructing the sight of the sun it's very interesting story by the way very symbolic story so rishi agast uh, people pray to him and plead him so he said all right and as he is going and wanting to cross vindhyachal vindhyachal bows down at his feet and as he bows sage agast is supposed to have blessed and said you stay till i return and from that time onwards vindhyachal remains you know without growing further and he remains in that position of nati now actually if we really um, look at this story this itself is a very beautiful starting point which connects us to shrabindu's yoga now all mountains as we know is uh, basically they are the high points of material aspiration and matter is aspiring it's literally mountains growth is uh, symbolic of that but its matter is developing developing to an extent that it is even occluding the sight of the sun which means that the truth which is going to which is hidden within it even that becomes occluded which we see in the age previous age that's how kaliyug is known that there is so much materialistic view of life that it occludes our vision of the divine our vision of the complete truth and yet it is needed so there is a working which goes on in matter but a time comes when a great sage like agast he goes past it that great difficulty that matter itself presents and brings out again the light of the sun the effulgent consciousness which is hidden in matter itself so there is a great um, uh, striking symbol in the story and then again we have another very beautiful symbol in the story um that you know rishi agast crosses to the south and we know sir bindu came all the way from north to the south one of the signs with which he was known to a previous yogi nagai japta when his disciples asked him that when you leave who will guide us and he is remarked to um his disciples that when somebody will come all the way from the north to the south southern side take it that he is the one who is meant to guide you further so just as rishi agast one of his uh, great identification high points in his story is crossing over from the north to the south we see something similar in shirvindo's own life and uh, rishi agast is supposed to be the one who gave birth to tamil language and it li- he linked it with the ancient sanskrit so he becomes a joining point of the two great beautiful languages in the world um two original languages if we can say so sanskrit and tamil so there are many similarities even the kind of work that he was engaged in so there are two three stories which will you know um, take up of rishi agast and then link up to uh, how shirbindo 
continues the work or takes the work to its great culmination. But before that, it may be good to take a little background of uh, what the seers wear because uh, we have a modern idea of seer who is wearing a kind of dress, uh, you know, usually uh, saffron or white. And the seer is mainly engaged in, you know, giving public lectures. And uh, maybe, you know, he has an ashram where he teaches some kind of meditation technique. So that's how we are. We have an image of seers and sages, which has continued down the line, primarily, I suppose, because of a great degree of otherworldliness that crept in India following, you know, a, a trend of thought. Now, I'm not going into why this trend came in and what purpose is served. They'll be going way beyond the discussion. But the idea of the seer that we receive today is not what ancient India conceived of as seers. When Shubindu speaks of seer, the first thing he says is the seer must have, a, have the mantra. So seer is different from a yogi. There may be a yogi who is not a seer and there could be a seer who is not a yogi and there could be a yogi and a seer. A combination we see in Rishi Agastya and Shurabindo. So who is a seer? Seer or the Rishi? He is a mantra drashta. And what is meant by that is that he is no more operating within the limits of the rational mind. So one could realize yoga within and yet may not have broken free from the boundaries of the mind. But a seer, because he has broken free from the limits of the human mind, begins to receive a direct perception of truth through faculties known as revelation, inspiration, intuition, illumination. And thereby this, what he receives, he has the speech through which he can transmit. He can put that revelation into a string of rhythmic words. So that is what originally the mantra is. And if we really look at, uh, uh, you know, some of these writings will be very clear. Now when Rishi Yagnvalk writes, let's say, some of the mantras, um, the holy Shaupanishad, he was not saying that I am writing a mantra and you please follow it. He wrote what he saw. But when he wrote, it is such a rhythmic speech. Now, those days it was Sanskrit. But the speech is so rhythmic, beautiful, that the sound itself as if opens the doors. So a seer is somebody who has the mantra. He receives the vibrations from the higher planes. He has the direct vision of truth. And what he receives when he transmits it or translates it into speech, written or spoken, it carries the ring of truth about it. And the classic example today we find after a long, long gap is in Shurbindo. Of course, the Gita itself is a mantra because it's a speech which has been received from the higher worlds. So this is the first aspect of a Rishi. But the Rishi was not just uh, somebody who was just, uh, you know, uh, speaking what he saw. He was deeply engaged in all the different fields of knowledge. So we have, for instance, Narada even before he became a sage. Uh, Narada, is, Narada is a Rishi because he gave one of the well-known mantras Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya and at the same time we see that Narada was a master of 64 Vidyas and we have Rishi Vasist who was into political administration he had the warcraft, Vishwamitra and when we come to Rishi Agastya again we see several these aspects manifest in him so Rishi was somebody who was translating what he received from the higher realms into real life so rishis were administrators who could guide the kings. The rishis were warriors. We know in the story of Rishi Agast himself, rishis were healers. King uh, Rishi Bharadwaj is the one who received the whole Ayurveda and gave it to Dhanvantri who finally made it popular into the world. The rishis were scientists engaged in various kinds of uh, you know, pursued, we have heard about the Rish, uh, Rishi Kanad, even psychologist Kanad is the one who gave the atomic theory. Uh, Sage August himself is supposed to be credited with the discovery of the battery. You know, his birth has been described in very interesting symbolic terms, which is also the way uh, one could look at how the first battery in the world was ever created. So they were scientists, they were warriors, they were um, very well versed with statecraft. In fact, they were not just well versed in statecraft, they brought in new ideas. So the, what the rishis were doing was, they received new idea forces and gave it into the world. New ways of healing. Like even today, if we look at, you know, we are going through this entire pandemic, how would Rishi Bharadwaj have approached it? 
Now the interesting part is today we are focused on disease, disease, disease. But how did Rishi Bharadwaj approach it? He said health. How to augment our natural immune system and practices by which we can remain healthy. So he was finding a solution which was not just confined to one disease or one pandemic, but a solution which would apply universally for all times to come. And that is the reason why Ayurveda has endured. True, it has lost its intuitive sense, but it has still endured. It's a branch which is more than at least 5000 years old whereas modern medicine is you know about 200 300 400 years in its present form and if you go back to hippocrates it's about 2500 years so they were applying what they received from the uh, higher worlds into their everyday life so rishi was like a bridge between heaven and earth his whole task was to make heaven and earth equal and one and that's what they were striving for to make this earthly life a better life based on the greater truths they received now their approach was very different from the modern scientist modern scientist you know uh, believes that he has certain instruments through which he must um, you know approach a study of material world psychological phenomena biological world and his instruments are the corporeal mind and the senses as they stand in presently organized form through an evolution of nature and they augment the senses by the microscope the telescope and such means so what was the process of the rishis the other premise is that matter is the sole reality. But the Rishis followed another line of approach. They said, as we stand today in our evolution is not the last summit. So it is possible for man to evolve beyond the corporeal mind. His rational mind can upgrade itself, its software. The eyes can develop a new sight, not just an insight, but a subtle vision, a deeper vision, even a divine vision. His ears can be tuned to a deeper listening. And by these means, he can actually experience reality in a very different way. And thereby, they started giving their own theories. I mean, it was like working from within outwards. So modern uh, science goes from outside inside because, you know, uh, it doesn't believe in conscious human evolution. It believes in education, which is a paradox because all education implies that there is a possibility of self-evolution to some degree. So on one side, science, there are two ways to approach science as I use the word. Uh, because we have used the word, you know, Rishi August as a scientist. So what does it mean? What kind of science was he practicing? One approach of science is surface to the depths and from below upward. So this is a bottom-up view and surface inside view. But the kind of science that the sages brought um, into the light, which has endured the rub and change of time, though, you know, its real um, uh, methodology and purport has been lost. Uh, I mean, we see in Sri a great revival of that and the mother's life, of course. But if we really look at that science is a top-down view. So arrive at the ultimate reality and from there you look at things, which makes lo much more logical sense, at least to me, because then you have a picture of the whole. It's like some Somebody is climbing the mountains and describing little detail here and little detail there which has its meaning. But when you go to the mountain top and when you look at the whole thing, it gives another perspective. So both these things are important. But for them, they chose first to go to the mountain summits and then start coming down. And from that total picture, you start understanding the you know place of everything take for example that you know when we uh, foray into a forest we observe you know tea, trees where uh, snakes uh, have their house now when we really look at nature it has been said and it's to an extent true that wherever you find that snakes uh, infest a tree nearby you will also find a cure for um, you know if there is a snake bite now what what was the logic of nature the logic of the the logic behind it is that rishis treated nature as a conscious force they were not looking at nature merely as a mechanical material view which we have to master control and the way you know we uh, we take money and we believe we are kings so the rishis looked at nature and all the forces of nature as conscious forces on which we can act through different means, conscious means. You know, when uh, here mother gave a prayer to the rain, prayer to the sun. Now today many of us, you know, who are trained into the Western model of science may well think that this is superstition. But, you know, we have never really tried it. When we look at the Ramayana, when 
uh, you know, uh, Lakshmana picks up the bow and arrow and asks the sea to give passage to the army of Lanka. He is describing another kind of science and another approach to science. So one is where we deal with mechanic nature as a mechanical material nature with the mind, um, which the mind can harness and use it for its own egoistic purposes. Rishis did not look at nature like that. They looked at nature as a conscious force. And while they knew that nature's forces are given to man to be harnessed and used, they would never do it in uh, contravening the principle that nature acts as a whole. She is a conscious force. And when we worship her and when we learn how to master her energies in the right way, nature herself will yield her, yield her secrets. So we see that in the life of Rishi August. For example, there comes a, a time when Again, we see Rishi Agast associated with two wars, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So in the Ramayana, the war is very, and you know, we'll compare it with Sri life. So in Ramayana, the war is very interesting that when uh, Lord Rama is going all the way, uh, he goes to Rishi Agast and his ashram. So Rishi Agast gives him celestial weapons. So what are these celestial weapons? They're not just bows and arrows. Bows and arrows are always symbols. So... What is the bow? Bow is the body. And what is the string? String is your nature which is ever in motion. So body is the basis. And the arrow is the power of concentration which must go to the target. So we will always see these celestial weapons given as so many arrows which can go to different targets. And they were various kinds of forces, inner forces, not just, uh, you know, of course one can do it on the tip of an arrow also. Uh, I believe Pavitra Da had once discovered the formula of how to make an atomic uh, energy on the tip of an arrow and he disclosed to the mother and the mother said, you know it, I know it and that should be the end of it. So, there are ways and means, there are powers hidden within which they could unleash and release. And through these powers, they could act upon forces which were at once forces of nature, demonic forces, celestial forces, even godlike forces. So this is what, uh, you know, Rishi Agast gives to Rama, who is himself trained uh, so beautifully by none, none else but uh, Rishi Vishwamitra. That itself, you know, speaks for itself. But at the same time, he gives him weapons which are not yet there in his armamentarium. At the same time, what Rishi Agas says, when the actual war is going to begin, he uh, sits quiet and he says that I want to shut myself in and at another level, at a subtle level, I have to also engage in this war against Ravana. It is also said that, you know, he is the one who gave the uh, famous um, Aditya Hridayam, just as uh, Lopa Mudra, his consort, who is also Rishika, uh, she gave the Lalita Sahasranam to humanity. So we have these rishis who were deeply engaged in different kinds of activities. So science we see, we also see warcraft and something similar in the life of Sri when the Second World War is going on, then Sri had put all his forces against the allies and that time, I mean in favor of the allies and against the Axis powers and he could see through the working of the war, sitting in his room, just like Rishi Agast, he was waging the war and sitting in his room, he was charging the instruments who were meant to become ultimately the victors because the divine force were working from behind them. So such a similarity. And again, we see that just as Rishi Agast at a time point of time gives the great invocation to the sun and Rishi Vishwamitra gave the Gayatri Mantra, which again is invocation of the sun's power, Sri not only gives the mantra for the sun, uh, supramental sun, which we know today as Sri Gayatri, Om Tat Savitur Varam Rupam Jyotihi Parasya Dhimahi Yannaha Deepen Satyena Deepayet. So, but at the same time, he gave Savitri, which again is, you know, the, the, the most auspicious form of the sun given the form of an entire mantric literature. So, we see such similarities in their lives. Then there is another two more stories which, uh, you know, link up the two. One story is, of course, narrated in the Mahabharata that there are two demon brothers. One is Vatapi and the other I think is uh, Ilavan. Uh, I may be slightly mistaken with regard to the name. But anyways, it doesn't matter. And we need not remember the name of the Asuras. But they, these brothers are very naughty and uh, they would call all the Brahmins and tell them that, you know, if you have meal at my place, I will give you... Uh, this wealth, that wealth and he had considerable wealth and you know they would get lured. After all Brahmin was living on uh, state arms. He was not supposed to earn a livelihood. So it was only through Dakshina that he had to lead his life. That was one of the requirement because knowledge cannot be sold. But you can receive something when a recipient of knowledge gives 
uh, in the course of time. So these Brahmins will go and he had learned this uh, Sanjeevani mantra. So uh, Ilavan will, um, you know, make a meat out of uh, Vatapi, turning him into a buffalo. And this meat was served to the Brahmins. Well, those were the days when people did eat meat. There are several references to that, so we're not going into that detail. It doesn't matter. Some vegetable or meat, it's not really relevant. And they ate it. Uh, and when they ate it, then he would, uh, you know, recount that mantra. And with the mantra, Vatapi would get uh, reconstituted and come out. And as he would come out, their bellies would be torn and these, they will die. So they used to take a kind of uh, big fun in that. Uh, I'll come to this story's other ramifications also. But when August comes to know about it, so August Rishi at that point of time, he also needed money. So he goes there and when he served the meat and all the Brahmins are worried, he says, tells them, don't worry, I'll take the meat part. And he eats it and he immediately utters a mantra that Vatapi Jema Bhava, Matlab, you get digested inside. And then when his brother uses the mantra, he just belches out the gas and says he's all digested. Now, interesting part is in this story I find, one is of course there are demons which are inside, which trouble us, which kill us. And the, there is a way, yogic way of dealing with these demons. There is a power which can assimilate them completely, a greater power. And even, you know, just release it in very small ways. Uh, because I, I find the name Vatapi very significant because in Ayurveda we use the word Vat, Pitt and Kaf and Vat literally refers to the Pranavayu. So basically it is the disordered Prana which these demons were creating inside these beings who were eating. So this disordered Prana was the source of all diseases. So today also, if you look at the Ayurvedic way of understanding life, it is about the fivefold movement of pranas, uh, especially the two which move up, which is meant to take the energies upward, then two move downwards to maintain the bodily uh, functions and uh, things associated with that, and one samana which balances. Now when there is a downward movement of prana, for example, now what we are observing, so we think just uh, it's a breathing exercise, it's not not just a breathing exercise. When there is excessive fear, what is happening to the prana? It's moving downwards. It's moving towards the nether parts. And at that point of time, if the prana doesn't go up, there is such a heaviness inside that this, this ends up killing people. So what is the process? Normally, we would want to lift this prana upward. And while one needs the lower movement also to maintain the body, it's not like going into a samadhi, but we need to bring in the upward movement of the prana to balance the two. So the practical, practically it would mean that when all this is going on, instead of letting fear creep inside, meditate upon the uh, glory of God, meditate upon the grace of God, meditate upon the peace and light of God, and that is the one which will eventually assimilate and digest and maybe in a very small way, gas belched out, you know, water, that will be released from the system rather than really leading to death. So it was a, it's a very different approach to science itself. So Rishi August did something similar and we see Sri giving us an entire new way of approaching diseases. Now because of positive of time, we need not, you know, go into it now, but maybe some other time. That how to deal with diseases inwardly, that's exactly what we see, at least I see in this story of Rishi August and the two demon brothers, where all the Brahmins are driven by greed. After all, you know, one may be a seeker of God and yet greed may be there. And when there is greed, there comes fear. And today, if you look at the entire corona world, it's driven by fear, greed and lust for power. So these are the three things that are driving the world. Exactly as in ancient times, we saw these uh, poor Brahmins unfortunately coming and becoming their own victims. There was no business for them to, you know, go, go into that uh, king's palace and tell them that, okay, uh, we are ready to eat your food if you give us this Dakshina. But they were driven by that. But Rishi August could go into his den. He goes many steps higher. He could go in the den of the Asura and defeat him in his own game. So that is the kind of, we see, Shobindu literally entering into the den of the Asura. You know, we have this entire yoga which is based upon eventually the light entering into the subconscious and the inconscient regions and annihilating the darkness. Again, we see the same thing in the life of Rishi August, another story where Indra is involved. So Indra, as we know, is the global consciousness. The, he is Sahasraksh. He looks everywhere. So it is just short of the super mind. 
It is the god Indra, the Indra of the ancient Vedas, not Indra of the Puranas, who is a much lesser deity. But Indra of the Vedas is the ultimate god, who is the one who is the ultimate, all the senses. He commands, senses means all forms of perception. So there is a global perception of Indra, but yet in the subconscious he yet cannot see. That's where the Vritrasura is hidden. He has submerged the whole world below the waters. And in the waters, he has taken all the world consciousness and put it inside a cave. And it cannot come out. So, you see, the evolutionary power has stopped. It's so symbolic of what's happening today. The whole thing is submerged below the waters when we are all the time looking at life only from the perspective of a virus. So, it is submerged inside the whole world. And at that point of time, they pray to August that you do something. So what does Agastya do? He drinks the waters of the ocean. I wish we could pray to Shurabindu and the mother instead of, you know, uh, getting caught up in all this. So he goes and drinks the waters of the ocean. And as he drinks the water, water of the ocean is literally the world forces. Ocean, there are two oceans. One is the ocean which is in the upper uh, hemisphere and the other is the ocean which is Aprakritim Salilam the ocean of the inconscient. So he drinks that entire water and then these caves stand exposed and by the power of the word, which is the mantra, and Rishi Agast and Indra with his thunderbolt breaks open the caves and all the cows are released, the forces of light which were caught up and held inside. Now this is so much applicable today. If I look at it here, they have actually given a wonderful remedy for all that is happening today. This is the time to invoke the light, to invoke the grace, so that it eventually, you know, it's literally world has been jammed into a hole as if it is submerged under the waters of fear, subconscient. And that's where the light which should be used, you know, the children not going to school, all this, all the energies which should be used in evolutionary purposes and progress is not tied up and locked down inside the cave. This literally lockdown is like entering into the subconscious cave where it is all caught up. Now, it has to be released from there and there is a period through which, you know, people pass. In that battle also, uh, the battle of Indra and Pratasura is the longest battle which is described in the, uh, you know, the literature. So, we see again Shurabindu saying that until the subconscious and the inconscient changes, nothing really permanent can be done. And there is a colloquy between Agaste, Rishi Agaste and Loka, Lopa Mudra where they are really discussing this, that how long we have to dig, how deep we have to dig. So from that time onwards, the Rishis spoke about marrying the earth and heaven. They knew that, uh, at least Rishi Agast knew that, you know, um, digging deep into the earth, releasing the light which is hidden in the subconscious, it is this which will eventually solve the problem of the world. But they could go up to a point and the reason was that there is an interdependence between the individual and the collectivity. While Rishi Agast and Lopam Mudra were bang on, on the right track, but yet the collectivity was not supporting regardless of whatever we may speak of. There were great rishis but the collectivity was of the same kings, the same issues, the same problems. The common man was still occupied with, you know, even in the Ram Raj with all his dal roti chawal and his little life. So uh, the collectivity had to change and this change for the collectivity has taken us from Rishi Agast to Sri through so many upheavals. Just to need matter, to prepare man that one day he will stop playing with the mud and play with the stars and the moon and the sun. One day he will stop, uh, you know, looking outward and downward and look within and look upward. This is the whole journey. And now we have crossed that entire period. It's very interesting that Rishi August is one of the seven seers, though he is also the son of uh, Rishi Pulas, who is you know, regarded as the seven seers. So who are these seven seers? Uh, I mean, not the names. Names are found everywhere in Wikipedia and all over the place. Uh, Agastha, Atri, etc. Et Marich, Vasisht. Vasisht and Agastha are born together. So, but the beauty of these seven seers is they are the stars. So what does it mean? When earth is going through the night, these are the seven seers who guide us through the night. It's like a pilgrimage taking place and they are fixed. That's how, you know, these seven seers, they remain fixed. All aircraft systems, they often navigate through that. The sea systems, they navigate through that. So they are the fixed, the polar star and all these. And what it really means is that up till 
the sun rises into the horizon these are the ones who have released forces idea forces into the into the world each rishi has its own idea force and i think rishi agast comes closest to shirobindo when he releases the idea for that you have to dig deep inside matter and you know his whole life is connected with work on matter whether it's vindhyachal or vatapi and uh, when you go deep inside then you have to release and of course the uh, ocean where he drinks the ocean you go deep inside and release the energies of light which are trapped there and make the earth and heaven equal and one so that is the work which was started by the rishis in between many things have happened kings have come deluges and god knows what not has happened avatars have come they have all prepared the earth unknown to us we know about shirobindo the mother themselves as vibhutis when they have taken all the pain sorrow suffering taking the world consciousness right from the age of august uh, who are guiding us through the night but now the time has come to emerge out of the night into the supramental sun so we can look at it like that that rishi agast has held uh, his fort and guided mankind through the night and of course the other seers but now it is no more the journey through the night at least a handful of humanity are ready for the light and the highest light so that highest light is the one which can conquer and annihilate all the difficulties of uh, matter all the difficulties of the subconscious and the inconscient so we see both Agastya Lopa Mudra, they were rishis and rishikas. Now we have Shirobindo and the mother. Both are rishis and rishikas. Both have released into the world uh, mantras. The power of the mantra is the power with which the subconscious can be annihilated. That's what we see in the life of Rishi Agast and many other rishis. So again, we see Shirobindo and the mother, but they have given us the mantra which is still by upgrading. all the old mantras very interesting shirobindo is upgraded because now it is the effulgent sun so we see in tantra we have the worship of the divine mother and we have separately ya devi sarva bhuteshu shanti rupen then again shakti rupen sansthita vidya rupen sansthita what did shirobindo do to this mantra he upgraded it to om anandamayi chaitanyamayi satyamayi parme directly linking her to the transcendent divine mother who is one with sachidanand brahm then what did he do to the gayatri of rishi vishwamitra he upgraded it to the most auspicious form of the sun the difference between the two gayatris are that on uh, vishwamitra gayatri is an invocation into the mind dhyo yona prachodayat and it it's not yet the invocation to the highest or the most auspicious form of the sun shobindu speaks of varam rupam om tat sabitur varam rupam the most auspicious form that i want and let it transform my entire being so again he upgraded this mantra to go through the age then there were other wonderful mantras that the rishis have given which uh, both of them which we see again shirobindo takes it to what heights through savitri and the mother through prayers and meditations they are nothing but mantras and the mantras which are meant for the new age for the age the supramental age which is dawning upon mankind so the important thing to remember is for all of us this idea of worldliness and other worldliness should go away it was never there in indian thought we, if we look at the life of rishis you know they, and now we have such strict uh, division secular and you know spiritual religious is all to be done inside your house but as far as the world is governed we'll govern it by science we must understand that this is a division created in a certain context when religion in the western context particularly where religion was oppressing science and therefore a time came when the division had to be made and science was to be approached by one means and religion had to be approached by another means they had different goals science was for this world religion for the other world if you want to make life better here follow science if you want to you know book a ticket into heaven or some nirvana or wherever you you subscribe to a religious belief system and automatically you will be booked a seat in wherever it it believes in but that's not what um, uh, you know the ancient seers were doing they tried to make earth and heaven equal and one that is the highest science the highest science is the one which unites all oppositions all divisions so today itself you know i was just sharing this thought and maybe this is the right place to share it that what is maturity people often talk about maturity maturity is to be able to handle all the differences oppositions and contradictions 
and not just handle, to reconcile them and synthesize them. That's why Shubhendra gives the synthesis of yoga, where the greatest synthesis between God and world, spirit and matter, soul and nature. So the science of the Vedas was not just, today we try to interpret it that, you know, look, they knew what modern science knew. No, they knew much further. Their method was very different. Even when the findings are similar, so when Rishi Kanath speaks of atom, he is not saying the same thing which, you know, um, later on atomic theories, they, they are then like Niels Bohr and others, they are the one who again, no. For Niels Bohr, atom is still an unconscious entity. But when Kanath speaks about the atom, Anu and Parmanu, when you look at the Sankhya doctrine where we have all these men mentioned, it starts from the one Purusha, then Prakriti, which is a conscious force. And she starts entering into creation. It's a kind of involution. And when we look at life like that, we have a much greater power. Within each atom, there is a divine substance, there is a divine consciousness, there is a divine force. That is what is Kundalini. Now, so what will the, did the yogis do? They awakened out of matter this energy which is involved within it. Later on, it came in the form of stories. So it is another approach to science and that is what Indian science should be. I, I feel that because that is the ultimate future and direction that science will have to take if we have not to forever live in this division that there is this life which is worldly and there is the life which is otherworldly. The rishis were all the time in everything. Look at marriage. It's very fascinating even the way, you know, marriage takes place between <laughs> Lopamudra and Agastya Rishi. The marriage is taking place. August Rishi is the one who has made Lopa Mudra. And then he gives it to her father that you bring her up. And when she comes of age, he comes and marries her. You see, people often ask in this, this question in about Savitri. Mother is Savitri. Who is Shurabindu? So, most of the time we say Ashupati. Why? Because Ashupati is the one who is, um, all the experiences of Sri Aurobindo are with Ashupati. So then the question is, who is Satyavan? So when mother was asked this question, mother said, who else but the Supreme Lord? Now you see, the Lord is at once the father and the Lord is at once the mate. If we go back to the origin, we see that how the divine Shakti merged out of him. And then, the Lord became Ishwara and Ishwari. This is exactly what we see in uh, Rishi Agast's story and Lopa Mudra. Who is Lopa Mudra? Uh, her name, of course, um, there are many ways her name has been understood because Rishi Agast's story cannot be completed without mention of Lopa, Lopa Mudra, just as Shurabindo's story remains incomplete without speaking of the mother. So Lopa Mudra is, there are two ways of understanding it. One is who gathered all the mudras, the best within the old world. Of course, as per the story, the animals, but the best within the old world she had gathered within herself. That's how she was the most beautiful uh, lady, Rishika, who ever walked upon earth. Another story is that when she saw Rishi Agast, she was absolutely, uh, you know, sthit in one mudra, lope. She forgot herself in whatever mudra she was standing, she just stood in that and that's how her name is Lopa Mudra. Now we see this same thing in Sri and the mother story again. The mother brought in herself all the elements of the old creation. Why? So that they can be transmuted into the new, new creation and integrated with it. And we also have the same story that when she looked at Sri she went into a state where she forgot herself completely and only knew the Lord. That he is the one who is the Lord of, you know, his presence is enough to prove that a day will come when all this earth will be transformed into light. Now, there is such a similarity between all of these stories. And finally, that last story, which is very fascinating. So we have, of course, the Ganges and the story of Ganges, we know... It's a beautiful story. The Ganges goes into the sea and because the sea owes its name Sagar because uh, Sagar because uh, the ancestors who brought down um, Ganges from the heavens, their ancestors was King Sagar. That's how the story runs, running right up to, you know, the sage who, Bhagirath, who eventually brings the Ganges down. So there is the Ganges. The Sagar has the same, um, you know, uh, importance as the Ganges in terms of its purifying properties but in the south because now Rishi Agast is there he must create a Ganges there so it seems that in his Kamandalu he brings the all the purifying 
power of the Ganges and releases him as the river Kaveri. It's a very beautiful spot in, you know, near Madikeri where you can see that uh, river Kaveri which is regarded as Dakshin Ganga. So we see again Shurabindo taking all the past purifying streams running through the Vedas and the Upanishads. And how is he presenting the new Ganges in the form of Savitri? One Savitri, just as one Kaveri is supposed to have the purifying effect in the southern regions when people, you know, somebody dies, then Kaveri has the same importance as the Ganges up north. And we see in the north, uh, so many sages, seers and Rishi Agast is supposed to have come because the balance was tilting. So as the story goes, when Shiva is getting married, he also wants to go. And all the gods tell him, if you also come, there will be a great imbalance. The Himalaya is here. The Ganges is there. All the sages are there who are meditating on the uh, great Himalayan ranges. So let there be one on that side to keep the balance. Now look at the story. One August balances the Himalayas, the Ganges and all the tapasya of the sages and seers. We can equally say one Shurbindo balances and releases something much greater in the form of Savitri, Shurbindo and the mother and through their tapasya, all the he is at once the Himalaya, a kind of nobody has ever imagined. He is the one who made matter bow down, countless stories. You know, before his obstinate will, matter started bending to that will. You know, the whole yoga is based on that. And he is the one who released a new Ganges upon earth, a new Kaviri upon earth, and that is called as Savitri. So, I think we will stop here. If there are questions, I'll be very happy to take it. Vivek? Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, Alodhi. I think it was uh, such a uh, good uh, collaboration and understanding of our ancient rishis, uh, not only Rishi Agas, but uh, much more than that. And obviously, it was very interesting to see Shir Vindo's work and, and linkage with the Indian tradition, call it August. Uh, I know time is short. Uh, so if anyone has any question, we can ask. Otherwise, I have one question I can ask. Yeah, we can start with that. <laughs> okay. So uh, as I'm hearing you, um, we all are evolving, right? We have evolved from, called, as you gave from Ram Raja, collective evolution. Uh, as per the the stories of the Upanishad and Purana. In earlier days, uh, people had that power to bring these cosmic powers at their wish. They didn't have to sit down for meditate for years. If they wanted to call a God and God had to appear, cosmic power. Have, we have lost that power right now. So is it is still, why is totally lost? Why is so, uh, we'll uh, take that question. It's a beautiful question. First is that this power was not available with everybody. This power was available either to the rishis or paradoxically to the asuras. So, you see that Ravan was the one who had all the Navagrahas, which are subtle cosmic powers and many of these planetary powers at his disposal. Okay. So, basically, there are two ways of conquering the cosmic powers. One was the rishi who through intense tapasya and surrender. If we look at the life of Rishi Agast, he also engaged in deep tapasya. It was not like... He could just get those powers and thereby he could exercise it. So there were a handful of rishis uh, whose names are legion, but the mass of mankind never had these powers. But the difference was that when the rishis got these powers, they used it for Lok Kalyan, like what we see in Shurabindu's life. But these powers, even the Asuras try to have. So who are the Asuras? The Asuras who try to turn these powers for purely selfish purposes to expand the comforts of life, rather the pleasures of life. Now if you look at the internet and many such things, it's the same thing. The cosmic powers but turn towards a different use altogether for actually taking away the evolutionary impulsion in humanity and entrenching it more and more in material life. So that's the symbol of Sone Kilanka of Ravan where you have all the material comforts, but you lack the uh, Lord's presence. So these powers can be usurped in two ways. One is the right way, which is as we ascend in consciousness, naturally they come. Nature herself gives. Sri describes that beautifully in Savitri, in secret knowledge, that as we ascend, nature herself comes and gives it, that you take it. 
and many such powers are there um, you know we know the ashta siddhi of hanuman the vital siddhis then there are many others on the other hand we remain where we are and we force and compel nature by splitting the atom by entering into it not treating her as a conscious force by but by means which are mechanical now what will what will happen is that we will get some powers but because we have uh, not followed the sanatan dharma which means there is a law through which we must live by and therefore it is going to be be destructive which is what we see today that many of these powers which have been released have been turned towards uh, you know uh, ultimately they have harmed mankind uh, classic example in today's pandemic is the power of medicine it is a healing power but what has happened today now it has also increased increased you know the the lust for you know the whole pharmacopia uh, i don't want to get into that entire debate but it has taken away man's natural capacity for health whereas when the rishis brought the healing powers they did it keeping in tune that man must live according to certain laws of life so that he can remain healthy and along with that there was a pharmacopia which increases his natural immunity but this other pharmacopia has made us complacent that you know for everything there is a drug unfortunately you know even our ayurveda and this thing have started following if you have this problem there is this drug if you have this problem uh, homeopathy you have this drug but that's not how they worked they worked by asking there is something which man must do and then the drug will complement and supplement him but because of the modern pharmacopoeia hospitals insurance there is a certain kind of complacence now it is changing of course fortunately because of the new world we are emphasizing on physical health etc so always in this world two kind of beings had this power and both require a kind of tapasya the scientist engages in one kind of tapasya and the yogi engages in another kind of tapasya and i have told the lines which where they differ one goes within and upward the other digs into matter and goes downwards and releases the power this is the one part second is this eclipsing is required this eclipsing is required because otherwise at in each age if it had arrived at perfect collective uh, you know level of mankind ascension then there was no need of eclipsing but there are parts which are ignored if we look at the life even of the rishis they could not have the final conquest rishi durvasha vishwamitra they had their own issues i think the only one you find uh, spotless uh, incidentally is rishi agastya and no wonder one of the meanings of his name is one who is freed of all sins otherwise if you look at the whether it be the sage angiras you read the life of vishwamitra and uh, vasisht who you know all of them had those spots there was no complete transformation of nature so what happens like mother gives a beautiful example when we are walking on a road so you have the husband wife and children now old time indian families i don't know you remember with five six children so husband is walking one place wife is holding a child in hand walking behind two children are running in front two are behind now they have to come together and walk together so in the ancient times what was happening was few rishis and if you look at it it was only to initiate that this was given and how they were creating this through the sense of elitism this was required because at that point of time it was only those who were initiated this truth was not given to all because there was scare of creating a hitler hitler wanted these occult powers he almost had it so they this was not a collective evolution it was individuals who were evolving and they gave their good and but because the uh, you know progress is connected with the collectivity uh, the whole thing had to collapse that's why we see also the trojan war where a very developed civilization of uh, troy had to collapse because the collectivity around was tribes so same thing kept on happening it is like drawing attention children who are walking behind they cry and parents have to stop they stop even the children who are in front that wait we have to pick up those who are behind so nature's retrogressions just like in individual life so also in the life of nations civilizations and the life of earth the so called retrogressions seems like going down but it is so that it can pick up a larger sweep like the ocean waves which come to the shore they pick up some more things and go away and this process continues till everything is ready to take the plunge 
सो दैट इज वेयर वी सी दैट यू नो सिक्स सिविलाइजेशन और सिक्स चतुर्युगा सिक्स प्रलयाज बट दिस टाइम बिकॉज ऑफ दिस रेट्रोगेशन एंड फॉरवर्ड प्रोग्रेशन वी आर रेडी टू टेक द फाइनल लीप यू नो आई ऑफन कंपेयर दिस रेट्रोगेशन विद द डिस्कस थ्रो वेयर यू step behind and you are you know running the discus in your hand where it looks like going behind coming in front going behind and finally it gains momentum and you throw it fast so this retrogression is like the fast bowler who goes many step backwards so that he can come forward with a great pace so all retrogressions are like that it's there is a deep wisdom which is operating within creation and because there were some rishis who were spearheading but the mass of mankind was not ready that's why in this yoga first time we see not just the formation of a sangam but collective yoga so sangam is different sang is only for those who are believers but when it is said collective yoga it means it has an impact on the entire mankind i am not aware of any tradition in the past or uh, you know uh, recent times where this kind of an impact on the collectivity has been decided and why because collectivity is much more ready it has gone through all that experience so i suppose that is the reason why we seem to have come down the spiral but only for a greater ascension so it is like a spiral so in a spiral we come down but we go further up so each satyogi is one step better than the previous satyog so that's why you have satyug treta dwapar kali but after kali you don't go back through dwapar treta and satyug you take a leap and each satyug is higher than the previous satyug so that is how we have to look at it that we came down because the progress was not complete we had forgotten something now we have picked it up and now we will take a leap into the future which will be much better than the efforts of the past so yeah just based on what you are saying uh Maybe that's that uh, this whole uh, approach to science mm. and uh, how we disregard uh, the fact that uh, nature itself is a conscious whole yeah uh, now actually it's coming out uh, well it was actually something that had come out a year back but it had been mm. suppressed that mm. the covid itself is a man made uh, virus yes yes so what what we are really seeing is china has dropped an atomic bomb on each country <laughs> china has dropped an atomic bomb on each country i mean why because of the foolishness and arrogance and stupidity of men you know that uh, they just don't respect boundaries they don't respect nature and the whole uh, approach is so counterintuitive as you um, and we really need like a new science you know which actually is based on yes. this holistic view yeah uh, rather because it's it's amazing we are living through the greatest single uh, biological attack on humanity and nobody feels it because the news is really suppressed <laughs> just amazing so I, and i think govind the urgency of this new science is right now in the field of medicine to start with because here it is already entered so the political aspect is one part which i am sure you know needs to be handled it's already going in that direction but look at medicine we are still focused on you know the same i would use the word old methods of simply artificially boosting our immune system how about naturally finding ways and means through which we can boost our immune system so the whole approach of a treating nature as something conscious and not just mechanical forces where we can just usurp things and use it to our advantage and selfish ends that must end absolutely and i think people should come forward more and more with this new approach whether in the field of medicine in psychology so the subconscious regions we have completely neglected that or we have a freudian psychology which takes the subconscious as the ultimate whereas if you look at the indian psychology it is the superconscious which is the ultimate and the subconscious habits we are a bundle of habits including death and aging is a habit which can be changed only by this light entering into the subconscious realm where the where the grooves of habit lie so in every field in politics and administration so i often speak about this two kinds of nationalism where one nationalism is an aggressive nationalism like the asura which you serves into other and the other nationalism is where each country brings out its best in the collective yagna and all of them contribute to the betterment of the entire human race so lot of changes and i suppose this is a beginning i mean <laughs> every time we believe it's a beginning and uh, it's gathering momentum 
such moments of crisis help us relook at um, ourselves and the world redefine ourselves and the world and reorient ourselves uh, with regard to our own deepest self and the world that's what is happening today yeah, yeah. And, and just as a small example of what you were saying about the uh, developing one's own immunity versus dependence on outer drugs uh, yeah. very very small observation uh, on my part when i first came to the us it was a long time back uh, i found that the kids here because i went to school uh, uh, in college at college level they could not mm. do simple math mm. and i was amazed at why was that the case and i realized that every one of them had a calculator <laughs> Okay. so because each one had a calculator they could not do simple math because they were yeah. so completely dependent on calculators so it's biological the same way. yeah <laughs> so you know just by becoming so dependent on external medicines technology yeah, yeah, yeah. our own body has become unable to do its yeah. basic function you know or to defend yeah, itself yeah, yeah. so, shubhendra uses the word rickety and ungainly crutch from the vegetal kingdom that's how he describes it yeah So anyway, just wanted. Uh, sure. I think Vivek is back, so I can probably yes. give him the mic. <laughs> so Vivek, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had lost connection for a minute, and so, but I think Alokji, the time is limited, and uh, we yeah. must respect the time. So again, thank you very much.